So uh, I'm going to be talking about securing your, uh, your website, making sure it's secure. Um, maybe quite a dull topic, so I'm kind of pleased to see so many people here. But I think it's, uh, it's relevant to anyone working on a web application. And I think the, uh, some recent topical events have maybe highlighted you know, that fact again. Uh, so there's quite a lot of info on these slides, so I'm going to put them online later on, so don't try and write everything down. Um, I work at an agency called Mint Digital. We're based uh, in London and in New York. And quite often, um, our clients ask us to do, uh, get third-party pen tests. So a lot of this um, talk is kind of based on experiences uh, from going through those. So I'm going to look at a load of different areas. Um, but I think before you look at anything in particular, um, you want to ask yourself uh, one key question. And that's, how secure does my site need to be? Obviously, um, some sites need to be pretty secure, like if you're running a banking application. Um, and maybe you are. But if you're not, um, you know, maybe you don't need to be quite that secure. And often with security, there's no right or wrong answer. There's kind of a lot of it depends. And if you know kind of the, the risks involved or the, uh, the risks involved in, in being hacked for whatever reason, then uh, knowing how secure you need to be is, a, is it puts you in a really good place to answer those questions uh, well. Um, so I'm going to try and keep uh, a lot of the examples relevant, so hopefully you can see how you could uh, apply these to your own applications fairly easily. Um, OK, so the, the first topic I've chosen to take a look at is uh, SQL injection, uh, mainly because the Open Web uh, Application Security Project names this as the number one uh, risk out there for, for applications. Um, so what is SQL injection? Well, I think this XKCD uh, strip highlights it pretty well, but essentially it's when um, a malicious user is able to execute some sort of SQL uh, query against your database that you maybe uh, wouldn't want them to do. And they'll do this by kind of uh, supplying portions of uh, SQL in uh, either a form field or, or maybe a, a get param. So here's a quick example of someone putting a, a SQL portion inside uh, the email field of a login. Um, which would then be passed on and could potentially be dangerous. Um, so it, here's how we can see how that could be dangerous. This is an example of some uh, controller code. Um, if you can see, we're trying to find a user where the email matches the params supplied. But, uh, but what we're doing here is we're, we're feeding it directly into the, uh, to the active record uh, method, which is, which is going to be fine in, in most instances. But if someone had supplied uh, the params, as we saw in the last slide, then potentially you could execute the SQL um, shown at the bottom, which is probably not what you want to do. Um, if this was a login action, for instance, uh, this would select the first user and uh, potentially log that user in uh, as that user. So, what can you do to prevent this? Well, uh, luckily, Rails has some inbuilt protection for uh, SQL injection. Um, and so you just need to make sure that the, uh, you're utilizing the, the inbuilt uh, escaping. And what it does, basically, is it escapes any um, special characters that MySQL would, would, uh, would use. Um, so if you use any of the find underscore by underscore attribute methods, then this happens automatically, so you're good. If you're uh, constructing maybe a slightly more custom uh, conditions using where or using uh, conditions. If you use the array syntax, you, there's two different versions of the array syntax here, then essentially the, uh, the params that you feed in are going to be escaped as well. Um, so a quick summary on, on SQL injection. Um, that was kind of a quick tour, but, but basically just make sure your input sanitized. And it, this, is, this is really easy with Rails because it has, has the protection uh, built in. So uh, the next topic I've chosen is uh, XSS, or, or cross-site scripting. And uh, what this is is basically when, a, when an attacker or a malicious user is, uh, manages to enter codes on your site, um, maybe through a comment box or something similar. Um, and this code is then output uh, onto your page. Uh, and when a user views the site, it gets executed, essentially. So I've got a few examples of um, things that you could potentially attack a site with. Um, obviously, these are kind of <laughs> varying. The first one is it's just going to be annoying. It's going to um, pop up in a, a script tag, which is not really uh, harmful, but it's, it's, it's annoying, definitely. Um, the next one is slightly more interesting. You can see this is uh, also writing a bit of uh, JavaScript. But what it's doing is it's sending the, um, the user's cookies to, um, uh, to a third-party site. Um, and this could easily be used to, to basically steal the cookie. And if you're using Rails and using the cookie store, 
And you could use um, something similar to that to basically steal the user's session, which is not ideal. And then um, the last example there is basically an iframe. So you could um, put an iframe on the page, and uh, what it would do is kind of maybe change the way the page looks and maybe prompt a user to enter some information so you could maybe try and grab their password or, or something similar. So uh, there's a few things that we can do to mitigate against this. The first thing is to make sure that your cookies are secure. Um, so basically, there's, there's two uh, relevant options here for your cookies. So uh, those are HTTP only and, and secure. Now, uh, these are both false by default. So any cookie you set in Rails, um, if you don't manually set these options, is, is, is going to um, be fairly insecure, actually. So um, what they do is HTTP only basically sets the cookie so it cannot be read by JavaScript. Um, and what that would do is it would prevent um, the example on the last page, which was where the JavaScript was reading a cookie and sending it to a third-party site. Now, obviously, if you need to read the, uh, the cookie by JavaScript yourself, this isn't going to work. But uh, I think probably if, you, uh, if you're doing that, then um, the cookie is probably going to be insignificant. It's not going to have any uh, um, interesting info. It's, it's not going to be a session cookie anyway. Um, and then the second option, uh, secure, Basically, what that does is it ensures the cookie is only sent over SSL. So if someone um, tries to, uh, makes a request not over SSL, the cookie is not going to be sent back. Now, obviously, this would require that you serve any pages that you want to use that cookie over SSL. But it, it's, um, it's fairly good practice, and we're going to look at that a bit later on. Um, so the next thing uh, you want to do is you want to make sure that any uh, input that's been submitted by a user is escaped before you put it on the page. And this is just to make sure that any script tags or iframes are not going to actually uh, show on the page. Now, in Rails uh, versions less than three, you had to do this manually. Um, so you could do that with the HTML escape method, which is also aliased as H. Um, and there was like a few gems at the time which would automatically do this. Um, but it was kind of annoying because you had to go through uh, your app and just make sure that any input that had been submitted by a user was, was escaped before it came out. Um, uh, from Rails 3, uh, this actually happens automatically. So it's pretty cool. You don't have to remember to do that with, with all of your views. And, and the way it does is it introduces a new class called the safe buffer class, which, which basically means any string knows whether it's safe or not. Um, and then what happens is when the view is rendering, it calls this uh, method HTML safe question mark on the string. And if it returns false, it escapes it. And if it returns true, then it just leaves it as it is. So it's kind of funky. But, but what it does mean is that if you do want to display HTML on the page, like maybe you have a, an admin CMS where you can kind of enter content and it, and it does show HTML, um, this is going to be escaped by default, which is kind of annoying if you want to show the tags. Um, so in this case, you can use uh, the raw method, which will basically um, set the string as HTML safe. And then when the HTML safe method is called, it's going to return true, and then no further escaping is, is going to happen. Um, so a quick summary on, on XSS. Basically, make sure your cookies are secure. So any, um, especially the session cookie, you want to make sure that one's secure. Maybe some of your other cookies don't matter so much, but the session cookie, definitely, you don't want to be read by JavaScript. Um, and then secondly, just ensure that any input that's been uh, entered by a user is escaped before outputting. And as I say, if you're using Rails 3 or above, then uh, this happens by default, so it's, it's fairly simple. So I've called this next session, uh, sorry, section session management. Um, but basically, this is anything around login sessions uh, or anything like that. And the main danger here is that uh, someone's session is stolen. Um, so uh, a third party user has is, is, is got your session and then can then act on your behalf, which is obviously not ideal. Um, so Rails has a number of different session stores available to us. Um, since Rails 2, the cookie store has been the default store. Um, but you could also use uh, the cache store or even the active record store, which will store it in the database. Now, even though these stores behave pretty much the same way, they all have, um, they all, they're slightly different under, underneath. So it's important to understand the security implications for each one. So, um, if once you choose a store, I would kind of just do some research to so you know exactly how it works. Um, I'm going to focus on the cookie store because it is the default one. Um, so probably most people are using that. Now the the cookie store, uh, the security of it is basically based on a secret token which you set in the app configuration, and it's only as secure as that token. So if you make it a really easy to guess token, um, then the cookie is not going to be very secure. Uh, luckily, there's a, a rake task, which you can run rake secret, which will generate a, a suitable token. So you, you can run that and then and set it in the config. 
Another thing to be aware of is that if you've got multiple Rails apps, you want to make sure that the secret token is different for each one, otherwise you're going to, you're going to run into uh, issues. Um, we already looked at XSS, but I thought it's worth a mention here again. This is a really good way to steal someone's session, so make sure that you're not vulnerable to that. Another way to uh, steal sessions is over insecure networks. Um, you may have seen Firesheet, which is a plugin. Uh, a couple of years ago, seemed to be big at RubyConf when I was there two years ago, uh, which was basically a, a Firefox plugin which would uh, show you everyone who was logged in to particular sites on the same network as you. And essentially, it was created just to highlight how easy it is to steal someone's <laughs> session over um, an insecure network. The cookies are sent on every request, and if they're not over SSL, then it's very easy to, to steal them. So obviously, the, uh, the simplest way to combat this is, is to send over everything over SSL. Now, luckily, Rails has um, a config, which you can set as uh, force SSL. And what this will do is it will just make, uh, it'll make sure every request is, is over SSL. So if someone makes a request which isn't, um, they'll be redirected to the, uh, to the secure page. Um, it, it can seem like a bit of a pain to set up SSL on the site, but I think if you do one thing to make your site more secure, this is probably it. So it's definitely worth a little bit of setup uh, before the start. And I think it, it used to be quite common to do certain actions over SSL, like maybe just a login action. Um, but actually, I think that's a bit of a, a false economy because, as I say, the cookie is being sent uh, on every single request. And at least in my experience, when you try to do some actions, SSL, some not, it normally turns out to be more of a pain than it, than it, than it, uh, than it helps at all. And I think uh, yeah, it's just easier to do it to everywhere, basically. Um, OK, this sounds pretty obvious. Um, but often, this isn't the case. But if you allow users to log in, make sure you allow them to log out as well. Um, I've seen sites that um, require JavaScript, for instance, uh, for logging out. Or maybe they require some kind of third party plugin or, or something weird. Or maybe they just don't have a logout link. Now, if someone can't log out, then they don't really have any other choice but to leave their session lying around, which is not um, an ideal situation. So yeah, just make sure that once someone's logged in, they can log out. Um, the next thing worth looking at with sessions is a timeout. Um, so make sure your sessions don't lie around forever. I think the default, if you're using a cookie store with Rails, is that it's going to um, expire at the end of the session, which uh, with the cookie is going to be when you close your browser window. Um, how long you set the timeout for your session really depends on your app. If it's, um, if it's something that you want to be fairly secure. Maybe you want to set it to, uh, to a short period of time. But it's kind of up to you how long you think that, that is. I mean, to be honest, the, at the end, when you close your, your browser windows, is normally a good kind of setting for most people. So there's, there's a couple of different ways you can uh, set it if you want a shorter one. Uh, you can set it in your, in your config, config that session store, cookie store, um, give it some options, and then you can give it the expire after. And what this does is it, um, it will expire after the, the given time if uh, there's no activity. Uh, if you're using Devise, which is a, a popular authentication uh, gem, uh, the, it has a timeoutable module. So you can include that and uh, set a timeout, and it'll do, it'll do a similar thing. So um, basically, when you're creating a new section, so if someone's logged in, it's good practice to recall reset session. So basically, it creates a new one. And what this is trying to prevent, uh, what, it, well, what it's doing is making the uh, existing session invalid. So it's, it's creating a new one. And what this does is that it, it stops the chance of any session fixation, which is basically when you're sharing uh, a session with uh, a hacker or a malicious user, um, because they might have had that session already. Um, so what, we're just resetting that as soon as someone logs in. Um, I've got a few other things to mention in this kind of session management sphere. Um, I'm just going to touch on them briefly because I, I think they're not relevant for a lot of apps, but they're kind of the, the, the sort of thing that crops up every time you do a pen test. Um, and so depending on your own app and the risks associated, they might be relevant. Um, so the first one is concurrent logins, which is basically not allowing the same credentials to be logged in more than once at the same time. Um, this doesn't seem to be one uh, sort of particularly clear way in, uh, and how to implement this best. Um, so I, I guess it can be a slightly tricky thing to do. But I think the, uh, probably the best way is just to store a unique token uh, when someone logs in, uh, store that on the user model, um, store it in the session as well. And then if someone logs in again, or next time they log in, you check. And if these two are different, then you, you know they're already logged in, and you can, you can react accordingly. Um, 
The second one is account lockout. Um, this is fairly easy to implement. You can just store a counter on the, on the user every time they do a failed login, increment it, and then when you get to a set number of attempts, you can, you can lock the account. Uh, as I say, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, it can be annoying depending on the, uh, on the number of attempts you give, uh, but it's definitely a useful, a useful tool. Uh, okay, so password complexity. Um, it's definitely wise to, um, to implement some sort of password policy, ensuring that at least you've got a certain length. You don't want people to be able to uh, use one letter passwords. Um, after that, you might want to get a bit more complicated, so you could uh, you know, try and uh, stop dictionary words or ensure that there's alphanumeric and special characters. So how complex your password uh, needs to be is, is, as I say, is entirely up to you. Um, I've seen kind of really simple apps that have crazily strong password policies, and this can just be annoying. So I think it's kind of a, a balancing act um, between keeping the users happy and keeping your app secure. Uh, and, and once you've decided on the policy, it's fairly easy to to enforce this with the, with the standard Rails uh, validations. OK, so when, uh, when someone logs out, um, make sure you actually kill the session. What we're trying to do here is, is to make that session invalid so it can't be reused again. So one thing to bear in mind here is that if you're using the cookie store, um, uh, the way it works is that it just stores a hash on the client side. So actually cooling reset session on a cookie store doesn't actually kill that session. If you have um, taken the cookie and kept it elsewhere, um, the user logs out, reset session is called, the cookie is cleared, but actually the session is still valid. Um, I can present that cookie again you know, manually via curl, and the session is going to come back. So um, if this is a problem for your application, then you probably want to use a, a different store. Like I've used a, if you use the cache store or the active record store, um, calling reset session will kill that. So that's definitely something to bear in mind if you're using the cookie store. OK, so. Um, also on the session, um, hash your passwords. It's kind of bad practice to, to store passwords in the clear uh, in your database. Uh, the reason being that if anyone um, gets into your database and you've stored your passwords, they're, they're all going to be compromised, which is, which is not a good thing at all. Um, if you're using Devise, uh, the authentication gem that I mentioned earlier, and this is baked in, so it kind of it does it out of the box. If you're not, it's, it's actually a pretty simple thing to implement. Uh, like so you could uh, set an accessor on password and then encrypt it. Uh, before you save it um, in the database. Uh, kind of related is uh, use bcrypt for any encryption on the passwords. Um, you see I used that in the last slide. It used to be quite common to use MD5 or SHA, uh, but I advise against doing that. The reason being because they're basically general purpose hashing functions, uh, which are designed to be really fast. And as a result, they can be uh, Kind of rooted very fast as well. So bcrypt is a, a slow, uh, way slower encryption, and it, it takes a long time to, to decrypt. Um, there's a great post um, by uh, Coda Hale on how to, to do this, and essentially that's the uh, that's the takeaway. Okay, so also in sessions, uh, don't store any large objects in the session. Um, ideally, you just want to be storing the current user, so the user ID. Um, uh, sessions, especially if you're using the cookie store, are readable by the user. Um, they're easy to be left lying around, so you know, just, just keep the minimum in there. Um, again, if you are using the cookie store, there's a hard limit of uh, four kilobytes, uh, although that is pretty massive for a session, so you shouldn't get anywhere near that. Um, also, don't store any critical data in the session. As I say, it's fairly easy uh, for a user to read their session. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, it's not wise to keep anything critical there. Um, yeah, you, could, you could easily the, the user could easily tamper with it. So, keep that to the uh, to the minimum. All right. So, a, a quick summary on on sessions. Um, I think SSL is the main takeaway here. Just just do it on your site. Do it everywhere. Uh, it'll keep you nice and safe. Um, Hash any important data, especially passwords, but potentially other things. Um, I've had requirements for email addresses and similar. It kind of depends on your requirements. And then make sure you clear sessions when uh, suitable, so you know, after a user logs in and also when they log out. OK, so mass assignment. This is actually pretty rail specific, although it could apply to other frameworks. Um, uh, but if someone knows you're running a Rails application, this is actually a really easy thing to exploit. Um, I think this is kind of pretty well known. Uh, recently, GitHub were compromised in this way um, quite publicly, so it's kind of pretty of the moment. 
And so here's, here's how it can happen. Basically, uh, Rails gives all model uh, columns, DB columns, and methods automatic getters and setters, which is obviously really handy um, for your application. Um, makes things really easy, but also makes it really easy to set uh, columns that you might want to not want to do. So here's an example. We've got some controller code, which is accepting um, params user. Um, but if someone sort of manually tampers with those and supplies um, maybe like an admin flag, for instance, these are just going to go straight through to your model, and, and someone could potentially set themselves as an admin or, or similar. So there's a number of things we can do to prevent this. Um, the first one is you can use Atta Protected. Um, and what this does is that, uh, anything that's in this list, um, users can't, you, you can't set by uh, mass assignment. So this is um, a really simple way to do it, but it's, it's not actually the best way. Kind of uh, on the flip side, and this is a, a better way you can use Atta Accessible. And what this does is it um, wears the last one was a blacklist. Uh, sorry, uh, oh, yeah, the last one was a blacklist. This is a whitelist, so you're saying which ones can be uh, mass assigned. And the reason this is better is that, as I say, Rails um, gives all your methods, all your DB columns, uh, getters and setters. And it's, uh, that includes active record associations. Uh, and so if you were doing the uh, blacklist method, it would be, uh, there's a good chance you're going to miss something important. Um, and you can, you, know, you can set assignments and things like that as well. Um, yeah, so this is definitely the best way. And there's also a config here. Uh, whitelist attributes, and if you set that as true, what that does is um, it basically uh, creates a blank whitelist for every model in your application, which kind of ensures that there's no way you can forget about it. Um, I mean, what it probably is going to do is going to cause you problems because you've missed some whitelist out, but I think that kind of cautious approach is definitely uh, a better approach. Uh, Atter Accessible also allows you to kind of scope things, so potentially some users, maybe an admin user, you want to set everything. So what you can do is you can say that um, you can't mass assign role unless you're an admin. So we've given this as admin scope. And then here's how you would set it. You basically pass in the scope when you're doing a create or an update, and that will allow those, allow those to be set. Um, so one other uh, approach to, to, to doing mass assignment, which has kind of came up recently, um, was that rather than doing it in the model, maybe the controller is the correct place to do this. Um, and this is kind of, it's called the slice pattern. So basically what you're doing is you're taking the params that have been submitted and you're slicing out the ones that you allow. So again, it's a, it's a whitelist approach. Um, so in, in this example, um, we're not feeding the params directly into the crate, but we're actually taking them through another method, which is saying these ones are allowed. And uh, DHH has created a gem, uh, which does exactly this. Um, parameters can't be used in AR mass assignments until they've been whitelisted, and this, this gem basically um, forces that. Um, so this actually only works with the, the more recent version of Rails, but uh, it's definitely worth a look, um, and it's quite easy to do something similar yourself. So quick summary on uh, XSS. So use Atter Accessible is probably the most common way. Um, potentially look at the slice pattern, move your thing from the model to the controller if you're interested in that. And then finally, use Atta Protected. It's definitely the, uh, probably the last thing to do, but it's, it's better than nothing. OK, um, direct object reference. Basically, this is uh, where a malicious user can, um, can guess uh, from a URL structure how to access uh, particular objects. Um, Rails use pretty predictable URLs, especially if you're using a kind of REST structure to your application. So this is fairly easy to do. Um, and if you're not careful, if you're not um, checking that users are allowed to do something, they could definitely uh, do something unintended. So here's a, a quick example. We're finding a user um, from the supplied params, and then we're creating a note based on that user. And um, code like this would make it very easy for me to submit uh, and create a note on behalf of any other user, which is obviously uh, not what you want to do. So. Uh, I guess the, the first um, suggestion here is always find the user from the session. Don't find it from the params. It's kind of a silly thing to do. Um, as I say, you, you're probably going to have a, a current user stored in the session, so just find that. And then the next thing is use your, the association methods to create the, the object in question. And in the, um, the object on Rails book, this is called the lone wolf pattern. So basically, you don't want to see any objects instantiated directly in the co controller code. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to make sure that the note you're creating belongs to the, the user that you've pulled from the session. Um, this also applies to viewing objects, if, if uh, an object should only be viewed by its creator. 
Um, you can see this code here would allow me to view any note essentially just by changing the, the URL. Um, so if, for instance, um, you only want the curator to view it, you, you could do something similar. Again, find the user via the session. I mean, probably this would happen in a filter or something. Um, and then use the association methods. And what's going to happen here is that if um, I call notes.find with an ID of a note that doesn't belong to me, it's going to raise a 404, which is probably the, the correct response that you want. Um, so another approach, uh, maybe uh, certain users are allowed to view other users' notes, is basically just put some uh, permission checking uh, before finding uh, the, the note in question. So here, we, again, we're finding the user from the session. We're finding the note from the, um, the ID in the param, but then we're doing a check here. We're, we're checking if it's editable by the user in question. And this can obviously be expanded to, to kind of encapsulate any uh, particular permission logic you have. OK, so a quick summary there. Um, find your users from the session. And always try and use the scoping method. Don't use any lone wolf kind of um, object finding. OK, so uh, the next thing I'm going to look at is CSA for cross-site re request forgery. Um, basically, the way this works is uh, by including code on a third-party site that accesses another site that the users believe to have an active session. And then what this does is it makes a request on behalf of that user. Um, and this could potentially be used to update or delete something on that user's behalf. So for example, I've got a site. I include an image tag with the, uh, this URL. Um, if the user that's viewing my site is already logged into example.com and has a valid session, um, their session is going to be sent. Um, and potentially, it's going gonna, it's gonna to execute whatever's on that URL. Um, and that could have consequences that you don't want. So the, the first thing you want to do here is basically use the correct HTTP verb. In the last example, it's an image tag, so it's going to make a get request. But that URL kind of looked like it was going to be doing some kind of destructive action. Um, and so get requests aren't really designed for that. So make sure you're using the correct thing. So um, use get requests for any safe requests or something that sounds like a, like a query or a question. So basically, you're just getting data back. And then use post, put, or delete, although in reality, we're talking about post here. For any requests that are destructive or they change resources or they create resources, um, basically things that sound like, more like orders than, uh, than questions. Um, so obviously, it would be possible to make non-get requests from a third party site using JavaScript or, or similar. Um, so we need to go and do an extra step for, for non-get requests. And um, basically, the, the easiest way to do this is to supply some kind of uh, unique token with any non-get request. And this should be kind of something that's hard to guess. And usually, you do it as a, a hidden form field. Um, and then on the back end, you basically compare that token with the token that you know it should be. Um, and if they match up, then the request is good. And if they don't, then um, it's probably a rogue request. Now, um, Rails makes this really, really easy to do. Um, just this one line in your application controller will automatically spit out the hidden form field on your form. That's assuming that you've used one of the um, Form 4 helpers. And then it automatically validates on submission that these, uh, this matches what it expects. Um, and if it doesn't, it raises uh, a 422, I think it's action controller invalid authenticity token. Um, one thing to bear in mind if you're uh, caching any of your pages, so that could be page caching or uh, action caching, um, obviously the authenticity token is going to get cached as well, and you're going to get errors like this. So um, you might need to be careful there. All right, so a quick summary uh, for CSERV. So basically, make sure you're using the correct HTTP verbs. Um, if you're using REST, which I guess most people are on modern Rails apps, then this kind of, this kind of comes for free. But if you're creating any uh, custom routes, uh, make sure you use um, the correct verbs, as I say. Um, and then use the, the inbuilt uh, CSERF protection with the protect from forgery and the application controller. So, uh, the next section, I've kind of put two things together, because I guess they're sort of related. They both deal with user submitted information. So um, they're redirection, um, which kind of doesn't really sound like a very good thing to hack, but actually it can be quite dangerous. Um, and then secondly, uh, file uploads. So um, redirection, very often it's, it's common that after you've completed an action, you want to redirect the user somewhere else. I guess the most uh, common instances of this is a, is a login action. Someone's some, uh, they're at a particular place. Um, they need to be logged in, so you redirect, redirect them to log in, and you want to read them, redirect them back to where they come from. So I guess um, one naive and kind of obvious approach would be just to supply a, a param in the URL, which says, once you're logged in, take me back to, to here. Um, 
But obviously, the, the problem with this is that if someone um, sends out a link, uh, they can easily set where the user gets redirected from. So you could um, put uh, an absolute URL in here, and they might get redirected to a different site. Um, or you could, they could just get redirected to somewhere else on your site that you wouldn't potentially want them to go to. Um, so an easy way to solve this is basically don't allow um, the, the redirection options to be supplied via param. So store it in the session, or potentially you could store it in a cookie and, uh, and uh, use that rather than the, the params. So um, moving on to file uploads, there's a, a couple of things to bear in mind here. So uh, firstly, make sure you sanitize any file names that get uh, inputted. So don't just take the file name of the file that's uploaded and, and do something with it. Make sure you either sanitize it or give it your own file name, which you've obviously um, set. So here's an example of a file name that could be uploaded. Uh, if you didn't do anything with it and just wrote this to the file system, potentially it could overwrite your uh, password file, which would uh, cause a bit of uh, a pain. Um, this is an example from Paperclip, which is a, an image kind of upload uh, gem, uh, which is removing any potentially harmful characters and replacing them with, a, with an underscore. Um, so if you're doing file uploads manually, then you could implement something similar. Um, as well as the file name, you probably want to sanitize the file type. Likely in an application, you're letting users upload maybe images or music or certain types of data. But probably what you don't want is any kind of executable code that could potentially be run on the server and, and, and do something malicious. Um, so again, if you're using a paperclip, it makes it very easy. It has a, an inbuilt validation where you can validate the content type. And you can, you can just feed it in here. You can see we're saying that we allow um, JPEGs. Um, if you're not using uh, Paperclip, then you can very easily um, set up a custom validation. So you just validate and then correct content type and basically just inspect the, the file's mind type and, and return an error or add an error to the object if it doesn't match what you, what you will allow. So the final thing on file uploads, which is often kind of missed out, is that if you're doing any um, sort of C, uh, intensive processing with an image, very common when you upload an image, you want to make a few crops, different sizes, um, do that asynchronously. Um, if you don't, and it's very easy to start a DOS attack because you, you know, say you've got six Rails applications running, um, you just upload six files in very short succession, and, and the site is essentially going to come down. So, you know, use um, use a queue like Rescue or, or something to do that in the in the background. Um, so a quick summary there, uh, kind of keep your redirect locations out of the params. Use something sensible like the session or a cookie. Uh, make sure you sanitize any file names or types that are uploaded. And um, finally, do any kind of image processing uh, asynchronously. OK, so SSL, we've mentioned a few times before, but I think it's, it's such an important topic that I thought I'd put a quick uh, section. So where should you use SSL? Well, as we saw before, I think the best advice here is just to use it everywhere. It's, you know, it's simple. It's a kind of a slight pain to set up in, in the first place, but once you've done it, it's done. And uh, it's definitely a really good place to secure your, your app. Um, another thing to bear in mind that once you have got your SSL set up is um, configure your web server so that it only ex uh, so it excludes weaker ciphers. Um, this is an example from an Nginx config, and it's basically saying which SSL ciphers it will allow. Um, if you don't do this, basically, um, you could uh, force a weaker SSL cipher, which has known um, security holes in it, which would just make it easier to compromise. Um, so this actually setting here is, is um, the default in the later versions of Nginx, but the earlier ones did allow kind of weaker ciphers. So um, check the version and make sure you're not, um, you're not allowing weak um, ciphers. So I think this is a pretty easy summary here, but just, just use SSL. Um, so I've got a section here on, on admin and intranet. And, and really, admin and intranet um, sides of sites are pretty common. Um, and they're not really any different from the front end of your site. Um, they're, they're just a different part of your web application. But I think they're worth a special mention, because normally users have access to these uh, areas of the site, have special privileges. So obviously, um, any kind of compromise here it could be much more harmful than on the front end of the site. Um, potentially, these users have access to, um, you know, to do everything, really, delete any other users or, or update data. Um, so it's definitely worth spe um, some special attention. So we looked at uh, CSERF before. The same applies. Make sure you don't mess it out on the admin section. Also, XSS. I think um, it's kind of quite common to forget to sanitize input on your admin console because you think, well, this is admin users. But 
what you've got to remember is actually you, you're displaying data submitted by other users as well. So it's equally as important to, to make sure your admin site is not uh, vulnerable here. Um, uh, good practice, I think, for admin sites is, is just to whitelist um, where, where they're accessed from. Um, it can be a little bit of a pain from a user. You know, if they're working from home, maybe they need to add their IP to the whitelist. Um, but I've seen uh, many times where you know, someone's admin account has got hacked, and then it's really, really easy if you don't have a whitelist for anywhere to access it. Um, and uh, this is a really easy thing to add code-wise, and I think probably the headache it gives you, uh, the admin users at least, is, is definitely worth it. Um, it just it, you know, just, just doing this um, makes the admin site so much more secure, so it's definitely worth uh, considering. So a quick summary there. Uh, as I say, all the, um, all the things we've already looked at, XSS, CSERF, uh, SQL injection, they all apply to the admin area of your site, but pr perhaps doubly important. So just, just make sure you've got that covered. And then secondly, um, it's definitely good practice to restrict um, who can access your site and, and where they can access it from. OK, so I've got a few sections here which are kind of moving out of your application code and are kind of to do with the server side and sort of deployment round about it. Um, these are kind of often overlooked, um, but I think they're pr just as important because it, um, it basically makes the job of any potential hacker a lot easier. Um, so the, the first thing is don't give away any information that uh, you don't need to about what software version you're using. Um, you know, certain software versions uh, have known vulnerabilities, and so if a hacker knows which version you're using, it just makes it easy for them to attack that particular vulnerability. Um, again, this is a, an example from uh, Nginx, and what this does is it will remove the Nginx version from the header um, without this set, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, not set by default. Um, every request is going to say, this is, this is going to broadcast which version of Nginx you're using, which you probably don't want to, uh, you probably don't want to set. Um, Secondly, make sure you configure your web server to give away appropriate uh, error pages. You don't want to serve back something like this, um, which shouldn't happen in production anyway, but it could do, um, because what this is doing is, is it's telling, uh, telling anyone that you're using Rails, um, which they couldn't then in turn uh, use that information against you. Um, obviously, in this case, uh, it's giving away a whole bunch of other information that you probably don't want uh, to give away as well. So summary there, just don't make it easy for hackers. Often these are kind of opportunist attacks. Um, and so uh, if you make it easy for them, um, you are going to be attacked. Um, if you don't, if you make it harder, then it's likely that they'll move on elsewhere. All right, so I've got a few things um, on the server side. Now, obviously, if you're using something like Heroku, a lot of this is kind of extracted away, and it maybe doesn't apply. But if you're running um, VMs yourself at all, or even um, servers, this is, this is relevant. Um, so user privileges are very important. Um, basically, you want to have a number of different accounts for different, different uh, jobs. So run all server processes as users with reduced pr uh, permissions. So don't run your Rails processes, don't run your Nginx processes with um, users with root access. Um, you're essentially asking for trouble there. Again, um, any users, maybe staff or employees you have, um, uh, make sure that their accounts have, have good um, uh, have the correct access. Um, and only really use accounts with, uh, with root access when you really need to, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's dangerous otherwise. Also, we looked at password policies on the application. Um, uh, similarly, at OS level, it's worth um, enforcing a good password, which is really, really easy to do if you're using a, a Unix-based server. Um, obviously, if you um, have a, a server login with, a, with an easy password, it kind of makes everything else slightly pointless. Um, so it, you want to make sure you keep um, sensitive data off, uh, out of files on the file system on the server. So a good example of this is uh, passwords. Potentially, you know, users are submitting passwords and they're logging in, and you probably don't want this appearing in your, in your Rails logs. Um, Rails makes it fairly easy to do. You can set a config to filter certain parameters. Um, you can give it an array, um, so anything that you, you don't want appearing in the log files, um, add it to that array, and it's going to get blanked out. Um, so this also applies to any other files in your server, really. So um, basically, your source code, your SCM, you probably don't want to keep anything uh, too secret on that. Um, but yeah, just, just watch what you're storing uh, on the disk. Um, so a quick summary there. Uh, just keep a good eye on your user permissions. Make sure that you know, the, the permissions are relevant and don't give away um, too much. Um, and then secondly, just 
uh, don't leave sensitive data lying around on the server. OK, um, so to wrap up, I've got a few resources. Actually, I think it's, it's quite surprising there's still relatively few security resources out there, especially as Rails is quite uh, mature, I guess, now. Um, but there are a few ones that are definitely worth reading. So um, firstly, the Ruby on Rails guide has a, a good um, page on security. Um, it covers most of the topics that we've looked at, um, goes into detail on a lot of them. So uh, it's, it's worth a read. It's, it's a single page, or it can be on a single page. So uh, you could read that in an afternoon. Um, no problem. The uh, ROR security blog um, is basically announcements of new vulnerabilities. So if you're running a, any production apps, this is uh, a good thing to follow because it will you know, update um, vulnerabilities in uh, Ruby itself or Rails and kind of give you any relevant patches. So it's definitely uh, keeps you up to date on that kind of thing. Um, Breakman is a really good uh, gem, which basically does uh, uh, analysis on your code. Um, and it uh, generates some reports on, on loads of common security issues. So most of the ones we've looked at, and a few more. I think there's actually a talk in here tomorrow um, specifically on that. So I would recommend uh, checking that out if you're interested in reading more about what Breakman uh, can do. Um, um, this is another gem, Tarantula. It does uh, fuzz testing. So it will basically crawl your app and kind of um, submit uh, loads of bogus data. Um, and you can kind of configure this to submit whatever data you want. So if you've got specific um, kind of attacks that you're trying to mitigate against, you can, you can configure it and then, and then just run it away. Um, finally, uh, OWASP, I mentioned them earlier on. This is a kind of a, a general web application uh, security website. It's not uh, related to Rails in any way, but it, it kind of has like a lot of common information that apply to all web applications. It, it tends to be kind of, I don't know, I, I find it quite slow moving, but it's definitely a good resource and uh, a good place to look. Uh, all right, well, thanks for listening. <laughs>